modern data lakes here. Uh, since, yeah. Uh, actually, we have a short page to introduce ourselves, but you already know us <laughs> in this page. And uh, actually, Alasio is an uh, open source uh, uh, project. It started from UC Berkeley App Lab in 2014. And uh, as some of you may know, like uh, at the beginning, it's like a school project at App Lab. And nowadays, like uh, we are like a very mature open source project uh, in the GitHub. And nowadays, we have more than 1,200 contributors, and uh, it keep growing pretty fast in this space. And uh, we're also recognized by the Google to say like we are the 10, top 10 most critical Java based project. And uh, also we are, have a lot of uh, uh, members in the community in the Slack. So welcome to join us there. And uh, at the same time, like we put a lot of effort to grow our open source community, not only from the technical side, but you see like we merge almost like one thousand pull request from the like tens, even hundreds of the contributors last year. And as last year, we also nominated five new PMC members and one new PMC maintainer for this uh, project. And at the same time, we host a lot of uh, meetups. I mean, last year is still hard. Yeah, people, it's very hard to get the offline uh, meetup at that moment, but we uh, still host a lot of like online meetup at that moment. And we also write more, more than 60 of the blogs uh, in our website. And uh, before we dive into the story of Alasho, I, I want to like uh, raise one question first. So why are the nowadays the data platform become so complex? Because actually, this is almost every community user like does. Because we have like a tens of the component for the big data stack and the, make our like data platform so complex and very hard to maintain. And uh, actually based on our uh, observation, we have we found like uh, we think there are three main reasons for this. And the first one is like uh, uh, the more and more data is being generated and the uh, data is being stored in the siloed. I will give a very detailed explanation what's it's siloed afterward and hope also will give some real example why this siloed happened. But actually this siloed make people have to uh, copy and manage all this kind of data across different platform, across the different uh, uh, applications and uh, make it uh, very costly and you have to do a lot of error prone and uh, cause a, a lot of delay to the end user for this kind of data. And the second part is because that people from different organization, for example, you can from different university and from different company and even from different team, they want to access the data. But actually you need to support the large range of the storage and the computer framework in this kind of ecosystem. So for example, uh, you have to optimize for the, for example, people from, come from Arrow, that you have to optimize for the Arrow, you have to optimize for the Parquet, and the, even sometimes you have to endure the throttling at S3 or all this kind of uh, system to optimize for them. It's kind of hard and the people, every time people told us like, it's so hard to do all this kind of thing, can you help with that? And the, the third one is like, uh, actually because uh, the needs at the industry, it's like revolution very fast. Like uh, maybe 20 years ago, people don't think about Spark, this kind of architecture. They just use MySQL and it already handle all of the, their system. Afterward, maybe like Facebook, like uh, do the distribute MySQL, who do the distribute MySQL to satisfy. Afterward, people even think that it's not satisfied all their needs from there. So people come with the, Hadoop ecosystem come with the uh, spark, come with the hype to solve all this kind of problem. So actually this happened every three to eight years based on our observation. And uh, let's see what uh, the traditional is not so traditional. Like uh, the traditional here, uh, you can see like uh, in the big data stack, uh, it's like this. Actually it's very complex and uh, really slow down the business agilities for the different organization and different companies. In many cases, uh, the data infrastructure started with the on-premise ones, uh, actually from the on-premise environment. As you can see uh, in the bottom left, people come with the Hadoop uh, ecosystem and they use it with the HDFS as the storage and with Hive, Spark, and Presto. And afterward, and many data team introduce, start to introduce the different application, as you can see here. 
people uh, use a lot of PyTorch TensorFlow, and uh, even with like uh, normal, like very novel like architecture by themselves. I know also people build all these kind of things by themselves through the like AI training platform. As a word, it to introduce a lot of application accidentally. So not accidentally, but actually introduce a lot of uh, uh, application there. So as the depicted, uh, depicted at the right bottom. And finally, adopting of the cloud solution. You know, cloud is so hot in the past like uh, 10 to 15 years. And actually nowadays, like people more and more adopting to the cloud solution, especially uh, after the pandemic. Uh, previously, we saw people always like claim we are going to cloud and we will do that. But nowadays people rarely do it. People <laughs> do it and uh, realize that uh, it's so complex, uh, especially we have already have a lot of uh, technical stacks uh, in our own promised uh, uh, environment. So how can I migrate all this stack into the cloud? Actually, there are no single cloud, even no cloud vendor can provide the like, perfect solution for that one. And uh, actually all of this kind of thing show very strong demand for the simplification. Uh, first of all, uh, they need a, a unified data set load. You don't need to deal with all this kind of data set load. And you, they don't need to support the multiple like storage API and uh, computing API for all this kind of thing. Actually, it's especially for the data analytic and AI applications. The second, uh, the storage uh, uh, with a story separated with the compute, actually, they still want to want efficient access. Well, previously, like people in Hadoop ecosystem, it's very easy to co located their compute together with the uh, with their storage, as Carol mentioned before, you can bring the computer to the storage, or you bring the data to the storage. But actually, nowadays in architecture, it's very hard. Sometimes, uh, sometimes it's very hard for you to bring the computer to the storage because many reasons. For uh, for example, organization reason, restrictions. You don't they don't allow you to like access others' data in some way. So you have to ask access control for all this kind of data in a very central way. And the lastly. Uh, the solution need to be environment agnostic. That means like no matter uh, which com compute you want to use in the future and what kind of storage you will adopt uh, from legacy or with in the future, you want to adopt it very easily without like worry too much about it. So actually with the, the very strong demand that I mentioned before, actually we introduced a new layer between the computer engine and the storage system. Uh, actually, we call the Alasho here. And uh, the new layer provides uh, what we call the virtual uh, across all across all kind of data access uh, for that analytics and AI. Uh, actually, it's uh, for both on-premise environment or the cloud environment. Yeah, so let's uh, take a look. Uh, after, uh, after we introduce Alasho, what it uh, looks like. And uh, the main difference here is like uh, actually we remove the complexity between the uh, compute and the storage in this diagram. Previously, you have to, for example, you have to do the data replication to move the data from the on-premise to the cloud and to do all this error proning and access control manually. And nowadays, you can rely on the Alasho to do all this kind of thing. And uh, another thing is like uh, regard of performance. Since the previous ecosystem is uh, mainly for the Hadoop ecosystem, nowadays, like uh, people separate the computer and the storage, uh, they still want to get the similar performance. Uh, even like they migrate from the on-premise data center to the on-cloud environment. So actually, we also provide the benefit here. It doesn't matter where your location of the data. After your first time catching data, you will get the same performance as the local data. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, like uh, I want to recognize, like Alasho, there are some of companies already use Alasho in production, and actually, seven out of ten of the based on the market capacity in the world actually is using Alasho, and eight out of ten uh, largest uh, of the internet company are using Alasho in the production. And nowadays, we because actually we start from the internet uh, industry, and nowadays we saw more and more like finance or the telecom and the media company also started using Alasho in their environment. Um, before Hope introduce our like use case analysis, I will give some uh, architectural overview, very technical architectural overview, how we can enable a hybrid uh, data lake. Uh, 
uh, in any uh, steps. Uh, first of all, uh, Alasho actually is consists with uh, several different components. Uh, for example, we have the Alasho master to guarantee the uh, high availability and also serve the metadata operation uh, for all this kind of for object store or file system request. And at the same time, Alasho worker is responsible for the data access and the, it will talk with the concept called the under file system. It can be any kind of storage underneath and we will cache the data from the object store or the file system uh, from the underneath to the Alasho worker. And we also embedded all Alasho client into the company framework, including uh, Presto, Spark, TensorFlow, Python, all this kind of framework to access Alasho data. For the worker, uh, we design in a very scalable way. Uh, that means actually, if you pursue for the high performance, actually you, you can use uh, RAM disk as your media and uh, to like maximize your performance. And at the same time, you can maximize capacity with RTR storage with SSD and HDD. And for the master, uh, other than uh, the own heap uh, metadata store uh, in the Alasho, we also provide the, the rocks DB option. That means uh, when you have the very, very large scale, like uh, billions level of the metadata in the Alasho, actually it's allowed you to uh, flash this into the disk instead of the keep all this kind of metadata in the uh, uh, memory, which, it may, may, which can be very, uh, obvious bottleneck for your uh, performance and the capacity. And uh, in order to provide the unified uh, experience to the uh, to the user, actually we introduce one very important uh, functionality called unified namespace here. And as you can see, for example, you have the uh, Alasho deploy here. And you just image if you have S3 schema there, and you also have a HDFS schema there. So, which means you have to support the data reader and the writer for all of this kind of thing. Uh, actually, it's pretty costly, and we say like for this kind of interface maturity, it takes quite quite a long time. And but nowadays, like uh, you can just simply mount the uh, S3 bucket or HDFS bucket into a large pass. It can be root pass, can be the subdirectory. And after that, you simply like access the, the data with the Alasho schema uh, with uh, the pass instead of like you have to implement a different reader and the tool. Alasho already implement all this kind of thing on the list. And uh, at the same time, also we give a lot of flexibility for you to like do a deployment. If you pursue for the maximum of the uh, performance, we recommend to co-locate Alasho together with Spark. And uh, that means you can do the short circuit read instead of network reading from the Alasho. But the, in another case, like if you Spark application and Presto application share the same caching of the data, you also can maximize the benefit with the disaggregated Alasho. That means you don't need to deploy Alasho together with this application, but you still get the benefit of the network caching uh, with this kind of architecture. Yeah. Then hope we'll give some use case study. So we had to hope to give some real use cases uh, with that actually. Thank you, Shouwei. So one of the things I've been enjoying working in the Luxfield is that I got a chance to learn from our open source users. We, we always get a lot of like insights of how they really use Alexi to solve their own challenges. So now I'm going to give you some examples and common scenarios that we see why Alexi is very useful, very valuable in their environment. So first of all, you know, Alexio, we have supported uh, both large scale analytics and AI. So for in, so here are three very common use cases um, uh, in terms of environment. So the first use case is about like, all of the cloud. As Joey mentioned, some of the companies have been there in their cloud migration journey, but some of the companies, they are more cloud native. So they are using Alexio in all in the cloud um, environment where they are using Alexio to provide them with performance efficiency and also cost savings. Uh, as you can see here is S3 cost because, because Amazon charges the cloud egress cost. So Alexio can cash on demand and, and minimize the network effect. And the second use case is hybrid. And a lot of the users we're working with, they're working in large organizations and they're doing cloud migrations, which means 
their environment is more complex with some of the data in the cloud and some of the workloads and compute resources still running on premises. So in this case, Alexa can really uh, serve as a hybrid cloud gateway to utilize some on-premises compute resources. Here you can see the Spark can retrieve the, the public cloud, uh, Google Cloud Storage GCS. And then the third use case is about multi-data center, especially for those users who are working in the geo-distributed uh, large corporations. And these kind, these kind of like data platform, they have multiple data centers in their data infrastructure side so that they can uh, use Alexio to do cross data center access without changing the ingestion uh, pipeline or adding extra step to the ETL. And then uh, I wanna share with you another very interesting um, emerging use case for AI or deep learning. And we are talking about tackling IO challenges here. And then we have observed from the community that the AI or deep learning workloads have some specific IO challenges. So first of all, uh, the training data set is have some unique access patterns because they are usually consist of a large number of small files, for example, like millions or tens of millions of image files, which is very typical. And second, because the size of the training data sets is large, as you guys know, um, we are usually, they are usually using a large data set for the deep learning and the more data they use and the more accurate their model is. And then lastly, because training jobs, they need massive, uh, they need very, com it's very compute intensive. They need the GPU and GPU instances. They are usually very expensive. So they need to utilize their GPU resources and keep feeding the data to the GPU machines instead of having the GPU waiting for the data to be ready. So that's the reason why they, they are looking for a better way to solve their IO challenges. That uh, here is uh, what Alexio can come into play. As you can see from the right-hand side, the, the, this, uh, this diagram is showing how Alexio is using the distributed caching to support the TensorFlow like workloads. And Alexio can not only bring the data on demand to the TensorFlow instances, but also can offload, like to overcome the bottleneck of the data it's putting into the single machine. And also because Alexio is a cache and also can accelerate the training efficiency, thus keeping, um, keeping the, the throughput high so that the GPU don't have to wait until the data to be ready. And then uh, these are the use cases I want to share. And then here is, uh, I think the most, in, most exciting part is to share some real world examples of how our open source users are using Luxio. I want to share like two user success stories here. And the first one is Expedia. So um, uh, you um, like here, I think people all know that Expedia.com. However, uh, you might not know that Expedia is a group of brands. They are operating a portfolio of more than 20 brands including Expedia.com, uh, Hotels.com, and also the verbal. Here I've listed the brands in this, uh, in this diagram. And because they have a, they, the nature of their business, they call themselves, they're operating in a brand world, which means the different brands, they are operating more independently and they are more of like uh, having their own data in infrastructure, creating some data silos. And uh, we'll, the, the Expedia, data platform team, they are Alexio open source users. So they share with us their story of their journey, how they, what the challenges they're facing and why they choose Alexio. So before adopting Alexio, if you take a look at the, the diagram here on the, on the bottom right, and then here is just some examples of what it was, it, what it looks like before Alexio. And they have a central, they call the central data lake here in the US East one region in AWS, they have some brands operating there. However, they still have many brands like operating in different um, AWS regions. This is problematic because, because AWS S3 storage costs, they don't cost um, if you are retrieving data in the same region, but it costs a lot if you are doing the cross region <coughs> access. So that is the main, main pain point for them. They want to save the, the storage cost. They want to reduce the total cost of ownership of their data platform in, in AWS. And that's, that's their, they are thinking about if there is a way to do the central analytics and query engines in their main data lake. 
And before adopting Alexio, they were using data replication, which they were using some open source tools developed by themselves. It's, it's half manual, half automatic, but it still needs a lot of work. For example, you can see here in their main data lake region, they are running a lot of different compute engines such as Hive, Spark, Trino, Databricks, and a lot of them like Dremio. It's such a lot of applications running there. And then each time if they need to join table from different brands or they want to retrieve some historical data, they have to replicate the S3 buckets from different locations back to the main region. So they will have a lot of different S3 buckets copying on a daily basis. So daily, so daily they are copying like um, more than terabytes of data. And this is very problematic. And the first reason is that um, the, the end users doing queries, they have to wait until the data set is ready. It really takes about a few hours or even a whole day until the end users can get the results, can get the data ready before they start doing the, the sequels. And then the second, the second challenge is that uh, because the, they are doing many replications, it's very error prone as they show it has mentioned, like maintaining the manual copies, needing to do validation over and over again, doing replication over and over and again, and they have to make sure that the data is fresh so that it, it requires a lot of the data platform engineers manual work. And, and lastly, it's still like a re keep retrieving, keep replicating the whole table at TB levels of table through the network from different regions to the main region of AWS costs a lot of money. And that's the reason why they are thinking about if there will be a more sustainable and scalable way of doing of like bridging these all data silos and after they they adopt Alexio and they have solved all these challenges and that our solution is very straightforward you can see like their manual replication now has changed to like different s3 buckets from different regions mounting to Alexio and then all of the cross-region data access will be through Alexio and uh, one of the reasons why uh, we are doing the approach of bringing data, uh, bringing data to compute is that Alexa can serve as a regional cache shared by all these compute engines, which makes a lot of like, which makes the efficiency really high. So with this, uh, with this solution by Alexa and, and the Expedia data platform team is able to, uh, is able to have all these data ready immediately when, uh, because uh, all of the all of the data access paths is from Alexio, and they have enjoyed a, a very great um, um, like the the results benefited from uh, introducing us to bridge these data silos. So first of all, these end users don't have to wait until the data is ready; it's immediately can be seen from Alexio. And second, and uh, it's Alexio because as a cache can provide very high performances to these end users, to all of these compute engines in uh, uh, every time when they're doing, doing their SQL queries. And of course, it's reducing the, the, the data traffic on the, on the, on the, uh, on the network, thus reducing their uh, cloud, uh, their data storage S3 egress costs. So if you are interested in learning more about this, real world example, you can just Google Alexio and Expedia and it will show the, the, the blog. Um, so the, the second story I wanna share is Billy Billy. So um, because it's a China company, so you might not heard of this website. It's bilibili.com. It's like the YouTube channel for a younger generation in China. And they are very popular in China right now. They have 230 million active, monthly active users right now. So, uh, and uh, and uh, they, they, are, they are also our uh, very active open source user. And the users are from their AI platform team, which is a little bit different from Expedia's case. They are like data platform engineers here are like the AI platform engineers. So this is this case is exactly like what I just mentioned about the AI use case. And their pain point is, for example, they need to, um, if, if they need to analyze the video that the users are uploading, right? So they first transfer the video into the, a lot of images 
So their training data set is really large. So they store their data set in their own object storage. And then they find that like accessing, accessing data and training data directly from the native S3 API from the object storage is, is very slow. So they introduced Alexio to overcome like the, the capacity of the, the data set, the capacity of a single machine, and also being able to um, accelerate their model training in a great way, as you can see, on the right hand side is is almost uh, is is like more than three times faster than directly retrieving object storage and then because more data is trained and then it model is getting more efficient and more data set will be trained in in more epic and and as a result their model efficiency is also increased they have improved the model efficiency by two percent and from the left hand side, you can see Alexa not only is serving the model training, but also sharing as a as a shared cache between data pre-processing and model training. I think this is also a, one of the benefits brought by uh, bringing data to compute. Right. So um, if you're interested in learning about Vividity, just Google Alexio Vividity, or you can just go to our blog alexio.com slash blog. You will learn a lot of about real world use cases uh, uh, from our uh, from our community users. I think that is what we have for today. Uh, we're happy to take questions. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have a question about, uh, so so the, the, the expedient case, right? Uh, the cost is a cross region transfer from S3. So I understand that you basically, so you solve the latency problem, right? You aggregate the data in one region. But you still it doesn't solve the cost problem. But like you can still have to ship the data, right, from the uh, so, uh, origin. So the before before using Alexio, we have to have to replicate the entire bucket, mm -hmm. which means. But after Alexio, we we only cache the hot data set. There are always tables that everyone just get access to, which means the the total volume of data transfer from a network is greatly reduced. That's the reason why like oh, okay. we cut half of the half of the network cost. I got it. Um, so it's interesting. So basically when you sort of like uh, quickly, so in, do you understand this right? You give access to everything, but you actually decide which one to transfer and cash versus you just not cash or do you cash everything just, that we just access? Just a few very simple example. Uh, actually the idea is like uh, you can cash the partition uh, just based like uh, the past week or past months. Uh, for mm. these people, but actually in reality, they found that it's very hard because people don't know which kind of data they will access. So that way, they will replicate the whole table. For example, mm -hmm. they, they mentioned to us like their biggest table is uh, 800 terabytes. So if they want to do the replication, right. they have to copy all the tables from the West US West 2 to the US West 1. But nowadays, they don't need to do that. Uh, when the, for example, Spark or the uh, pencil scan the packet file, actually they will just uh, get a very small portion of data during mm -hmm. scan. And when they read the data, maybe they just like uh, read the past the day's data or past the week's data into the mm -hmm. So that means actually it will highly reduce, like maybe you just uh, read 1% of the data in the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But is it strictly demand-based or are you also predicting? Oh, uh, without uh, predicting. Access, You're not predicting. Access without, based. Yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So basically, I just want to confirm what I got, right? So basically, so in the regional case, right, all the data is in regions. You want to run a big SQL query, you have to ship all the data to one place on the SQL query. Now you have essentially the table in one place, and so you issue SQL query, it does it. Let's say some data is not in the uh, in the cache mm -hmm. where I run the SQL query. Does it now go to clients? And do, is there a distributed SQL query being run at the, in the real time to basically get the missing data from each client and ship it back, right? Is it happening in the real time? Um, actually, it really depends. If you don't have cache there, actually it has the real time. Like uh, all clients will fetch the data from the underground system mm -hmm. and ship back to our cache and serve to the application. This mm -hmm. is, uh, I, I, I mean, you cannot avoid it. You cannot magically. So the, the, the first time when when the table partition is accessed, it will be shipped through the network. Mm -hmm. But then, like the the hot data will be stored in Alexa. Yeah. So I'll give a simple example, right? Like, uh, let's say I want to find all the users from New Jersey who booked a flight and bought a red coffee maker, right? So like, let's say you oh, like a hotel, right? So hotels in one place, flights in another place, in the last three hours, right? So like in the last day. 
let's say, right? Like, so the question is, let's say, you know, most of the data is already in cache, but due to the last three hours, one guy booked a flight in, you know, from New Jersey, the other guy booked a hotel. So how does the incremental update get into, uh, into the hub set? Oh, I can't answer question. Actually, uh, that's the limited analysis of Go, actually. Uh, if you are thinking about real, real time, you have mm -hmm. to use Kafka offline okay. for all this kind of thing. But actually, for their use case here, actually, they are still doing the ETL or call or data analytics mm -hmm. here. So that they are not so sensitive. Like, as you can serve the data, like based on your time to interval to refresh the data, for mm -hmm. example, uh, you can do the refresh every two minutes or refresh every five minutes. It's mm -hmm. dependent on you. That's fine. I mean, like, yeah. but, yeah. uh, actually, we cannot guarantee the micro milliseconds. Right. So uh, it, it, right. no, that's fine. It depends on how fresh the data is existing in the S3, whether or not they, they are st already stored in their S3. So, so the the freshness of this S3 depends is depends on like the, the freshness <laughs> of, their, of of how fresh they they can do the the SQL. But I'm just trying to imagine, right? Because like ideally, what would happen, right? I would imagine that I run the query of certain features. I know the data sources. So, you know, I will run them locally, but at the same time, uh, you know, there will be a request to other data sources to give me incremental data. Like, so if a Luxor client, I'm trying to say if a Luxor client master architecture allows to run a basic bring computation to data, yeah. ship the query to data, run it and send me this limited small set, right? Like, is this, are you guys can, can I guess support that? Uh, I can answer this question. Actually, uh, it's really depends on your use cases. Mm -hmm. Actually, when you ship the data, that means uh, you want to move the data from there to there. But actually, in Expedia, I actually don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, we mentioned that the brand of world and the uh, issue of acquired the company actually run very implementing. Mm -hmm. That means that they have the fully control of their own data. So that they don't want to like say like your company engine can very easily access their data. Mm -hmm. So that means they have definitely need some access control there to make sure that you are not over like uh, gain their data. Too much, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, but I think that that's basically, you know, I think that's also a fantastic use case for Skyhook. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because it's, it's, it's actually, you know, you offloading um, the, the, so this this is an example where you bring the computer data. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I like this 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 combination both right of of creating enough data on the cache side. Um, do you have examples where you actually have? So so if you have a query, right? And uh, how do you determine whether you have the data? Some data you might have already in the cache, and what some data you don't. Do you actually map the query to the data, or how do you, or is it is it strictly when you actually know what raw data you need to access, a, you then determine whether it's a cache data or not? It's a very good question, very good technical question. It's a very critical. Actually, yeah. for this kind of question, when you do the query planning, uh, especially for the Spark engine or Fast engine, yeah. or this any of the big engine, actually they will return the URL to you, so you know which kind of URL you want to do to fetch the data. Mm -hmm. they do the translation at the data layer because actually we don't control the metadata store for the system. Actually, you have the metadata store, store there and the, they store all this information. But under mm -hmm. underneath is uh, like uh, you will query this URL to the analytics program. We will return the block ID to the app layer computer framework. Actually, after that, People don't aware of this data is in cache or not. Actually, mm -hmm. Alasha will take response for this. If it's not in cache, uh, we go to UFS to fetch the data. But if it's in the cache, we directly respond to you. Yeah. And at the meantime, we also guarantee the consistent at the meta like metadata level for the file system. Uh, if the data is already expired by certain like five minutes or two minutes, actually we will fetch the metadata again to guarantee at least the consistent at this moment. And if we want to receive like strong consistency, uh, you have to do the metadata every time. Actually, right. you rarely hurt your performance. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I have one more question. So in, in a distributed cache environment, mm -hmm. do you have a way to coordinate these caches or do you have to cache everything in the... Um, so you had like an example where you had like one source, right, and multiple caches. For the PyTorch, I think it was either PyTorch or some other machine learning example. Yeah. 
do you do you have multiple copies of everything in every cache? Probably. Right? No, that's a very quick question. <laughs> actually, we do. Actually, any previous like half years ago, if you asked me this question, we do not. We rely on the other file system to do the update or this update. Yeah. And nowadays, we also introduce so called cross thing. For example, you have one cluster at the UC uh, Santa Cruz. Actually, you have another uh, data center at the UC Berkeley. Actually, when you write the data, we also were notified another Alasha cluster that we update the data to keep it in sync. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting to see whether you can actually do updates between caches versus going to the source, right? Because in some, yeah. in some cases- you know, you know Google solved this problem with the stack. So yeah. it's uh, not that yeah. easy, it's very critical question yeah, yeah. for the yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, so we're, thank you so much. Again. Uh, you know, this is very interesting talk. So I think this talk is um, by Weston Pace uh, from, uh, Walton Data, and he's going to talk about. Um, uh, uh, just look at the title, but it's I think uh, about uh, query engines. Um, sorry, I, I should know this better. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, so, uh, I uh, let me just uh, yeah. So it's about error native query engines. So it's almost right. Um, uh, Weston Pace has been doing full stack development in the telecom industry for over seven years. Uh, Pace earned a bachelor uh, science degrees in computer science and mathematics and a master of science degrees in computer science in Colorado State University. So very close to where I got my degree <laughs> in CU Boulder. Very good. Yeah, there's no rivalry there at all. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go ahead and uh, figure out how to get this to go to a slide. Can everyone see this okay? Yes. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I want to talk about Arrow native query engines um, and go into a bit more detail on Acero, which is a project within Apache Arrow that, that I've been spending a lot of time on recently. And it's kind of starts with the same problem statements that the Alexio team were looking at, which is the data analytics space is getting more and more complicated. And one of the things that um, I, I see that um, happens a lot is that the solution tends to be, let's build another all-in-one inclusive solution that solves all of your data needs. Um, and as you dig into it, you realize that there are many different problems in data analytics space, and you can never really come up with one solution that meets them all. So Apache Arrow started with a pretty simple uh, problem that they wanted to solve, which is let's get rid of all of these transfers from one memory format to another. We'll just pick one memory format um, and go ahead and standardize it. We'll implement it in a few of the kind of big names that are out there, such as pandas and numpy, make compatibility with those. Um, and then also compatibility with some of the big formats that are out there. So Parquet um, and regrettably CSV. So you can go back and forth between those formats to some kind of standard in memory thing. And that allows you to um, really starts to democratize the analytics space and make it possible to start to break up some of these components. I mean, if you look at a uh, Spark solution, um, anyway, I originally came at this from industry and we were uh, had a particular data analytics problem that we needed to solve. We needed to just kind of copy data from here to here. Um, specifics aren't that important, but if you look at a Spark solution, suddenly you have this sort of huge investment to get as all Java pipeline set up. And we had no Java engineers at the company I was working for. And um, there's you know a big learning curve and, and, and so on. And as soon as you step out of Spark into something that's non-Spark, you get hit with these serialization penalties. Um, so Spark added at one point 
the ability to run pandas UDFs. Um, but then those tended to be slow because there's a cost of going from Spark's Java data frame model to pandas model and then back. And so now with Apache Arrow, we can just sort of jump back and forth between different languages, between different libraries. Um, as I'm about to talk about, there's a number of different query engines and we can even bounce back and forth between query engines with very little cost. Uh, and it makes the transmission between these a lot easier. So as we did that and we built that up, people started to ask, you know, initially the, the ask was, well, we need the ability to read from files. And so we, we gave them that ability of, okay, you create these things in memory, you can read them from files, you can pass them around, you can slice them and dice them. And then people start to want to compute on them. And so it's like, all right, well, we'll throw in some functions. So now if you want to find the maximum value of an array or the minimum value of an array, you can do that. Um, and then people started to want to do more complex computation of things like joins. And for a long time, the answer was, well, switch to pandas. Uh, and, you know, that works until you have data that's bigger than memory. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, go get a database then. And it's like, well, that's, that's a big ask. Now, suddenly there's this big cliff, a big gap of functionality of going from, all right, I have two folders full of files and I want to join those together and do some analytics on them. Um, I can do almost all of that with just Apache Arrow, with just a library thrown on my laptop. I've just factored it into my code or my solution wherever it made sense. And now all of a sudden I need to start thinking about a database and, and a lot of questions with installing and getting started. And, and to be fair, um, you know, DuckDB and SQLite have done a lot of amazing work of making it much easier to start up a database and make it not such a daunting thing. Um, you know, and if you have a lot of data, then you're thinking about cloud solutions and, and so on and so on. So um, these asks have come in of saying, all right, well, we're just, it's just a, you know, a, a small increment of capability above finding the minimum or maximum array, right? And doing a join, that's a straightforward thing to write. Um, it, it gets more complicated, but we've uh, started working on a query engine in Arrow. And, um, as the slide here shows, just kind of defining what a query engine is. Um, I think it's a thing that has a lot of different definitions depending on what you're doing. Um, so for my purposes, it's this thing that gets batches of data streaming through it and then transform batches of data come out. Um, it's not always so nicely streaming. If you're trying to join data, for example, normally you have to fully ingest one of your inputs before you can start streaming data out of it. Um, and if you're doing any kind of like aggregation or something like that, you run into similar problems. Um, and, and these are all sort of well-known. They exist within databases um, and database servers that are out there. And there are, as we started working on this, we've become aware there's uh, quite a few Arrow native query engines that are now being developed. And this is uh, exciting, you know, my main belief is uh, trying to make the Arrow project successful. Um, so to see a lot of these engines tackling this problem is kind of cool. And I think over time, they'll start to diverge more and um, find niches and so on. Data Fusion and uh, Acero are both kind of formally part of the Apache Arrow project. So those are within um, within the project. And then we've got DuckDB and Velox. Those are outside of the project, but because Arrow is this standard format and they've agreed you know, to use Arrow uh, for the most part internally, as well as for interchange, it makes these things um, very easy to switch between. And, and one of the things that we've learned from this endeavor is that when we started with Arrow, we had um, array types, all your kind of standard array types. You had numeric arrays and uh, string arrays and binary arrays and uh, a fairly extensive set of standard uh, array types that got us pretty far. As people are now starting to work on these uh, query engines that use Arrow data internally, we've learned that there are more uh, interesting and different array types as well. Um, so I think some Exciting work is coming out and looking into things like um, string view arrays. So the array itself is just you know what you would normally have in like a standard string view. You have a pointer and a length, um, and then that's uh, 
been, I think, something that query engines and databases have done for a long time when dealing with strings so that if you have to do like a sort or a take, you're not copying around all of that string data. Um, so we're getting some exciting uh, new changes to Arrow to make it more universal. Um, and we're getting all of this sort of cool capability. Um, at the moment, I'm not, I probably am not qualified nor able to go into too much detail about what the differences and minute differences are between these different query engines. Um, I think they're all somewhat um, getting started. I believe Data Fusion and DuckDB have been around the longest. Um, DuckDB is kind of aiming to be more of an SQL light type database, um, whereas uh, and Data Fusion has leaned kind of more in the distributed direction. And then Velox and Acero are both somewhat leaning more in what I would call an embedded direction where you just kind of stick them in the middle of some kind of existing pipeline of work. Um, and there are some pretty cool things you can do because they're all using Arrow internally. So for example, we've had people say, I, I use a PyArrow a lot. I have a PyArrow data set. I want to run some kind of query on it with DuckDB. Um, do I have to do all of this weird translation to go between the two. And it's like, well, no, you can actually use Acero to start scanning that PyArrow data set. And then you can take the output from that and feed it directly into DuckDB. There's no serialization or you know, translation that has to be done necessarily. And um, so it's a very low overhead way of interfacing with those two libraries. And so you could actually you know, bounce and forth, bounce back and forth between these as you go. So for the rest of these slides, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about Acero specifically because that is the project I am most familiar with. Um, so I probably should have, uh, I think I've already addressed this for the most part, um, which is, yeah, we had a format. So we were able to go back and forth between files to get the data. And now we need to start being able to run compute on these things. Um, and I don't know if this is hiding the, let's see if I can, bring it. Um, Query Engine Basics, I think for this audience, um, this might be uh, very basics. Um, but the idea here is we have a number of different operators and all of the operators, um, uh, it, it matches execution plans that you would see in database servers. Um, the, the operations do different sorts of things. The, there is a sort of eternal question of what's the difference between uh, an operator slash node and like a function. So it's min or max or join, um, what makes it special? And what I've found is that the um, nodes themselves are aware of sort of the idea that data is streaming through them and they're operating on streams of data. Whereas functions are things that take in an array and they spit out an array. Or maybe sometimes they'll take in a table and they'll spit out an array or table in, table out. But they're not, the, the distinction as far as I, I've been able to tell is that the, the operators are aware of the kind of stream of data versus a table in, table out manner. Um, so we have quite a few uh, nodes in implemented already. We can run TPCH. We don't have spilling quite as far as we'd like it to be, but we're working on that. Um, so we have pretty good coverage of what I would say traditional relational algebra. Um, we are working right now within uh, Voltron data and hopefully going to bring into the Apache Arrow project some cool window functions and support for some more advanced SQL operations. Um, there is some work being done by uh, Two Sigma and looking into a um, like a non-traditional time series domain. So they've implemented an as of join node. Um, and so that's kind of exciting uh, to see multiple paradigms that aren't always talking to each other, be able to share some common query engine infrastructure. Um, and, you know, people are welcome to build their own custom nodes. Uh, we have extension points and the ability to write plugins. Um, writing a node at the moment is still a little bit onerous, but it's continuously getting easier. Uh, one of our 
big goals here is to be able to make sure that this query engine is simple enough and straightforward enough that if people are doing research projects or they want to you know, tailor the query engine for some kind of unique scenario, that it's not so hard to do so. Um, so we want to improve on that documentation and simplify our APIs to the point where it's uh, hopefully more straightforward than it is perhaps today. Um, yeah, a few notes on why and in what situations you would use this. Uh, Acero itself fits the model pretty well of a single node. Um, and so what I mean by that is maybe you have 200 gigabytes of data. And historically, that would have been very much a big data type problem. You know, you want to take that 200 gigabytes, throw it into AWS, get a whole bunch of EC2 containers running up that can scan and compute that uh, in parallel. Um, machines are getting more powerful now that uh, you can, 200 gigabytes is depending on what you're doing and what kind of performance characteristics you need. But for a lot of analytics, 200 gigabytes is not too frightening. And you should be able to do the operation on a single node. Um, you know, Postgres, for example, does not struggle too much with 200 gigabytes. But what we're seeing is a lot of the analytics tools don't have something that fits that gap. So you've got Pandas, which works great up until you run out of RAM. And you've got Spark, which works great if you don't mind launching an entire cluster. So we're trying to fill that gap of, if I have 200 gigabytes of data, it's more than I have in RAM, but it's not really enough to justify a big complex AWS strategy. Um, can Acero fill that gap of providing something that is rather fast, um, but not quite so sensitive to RAM? So that's our target. And that's the kind of uh, the, the gap that we hope to fill. Uh, it's part of the Arrow project. So we are trying to run everywhere that Arrow can run. We share the CI infrastructure with Arrow. So we test out on you know, Mac, Windows, Linux, uh, a variety of different architectures. Um, I don't think all of the operators work on big Indian data, um, but that is something we would probably want to do at some point. Uh, and again, it's open source. It's a fairly narrow focus. Um, so Acero is not going to become a database. Uh, we aren't really doing any work on sophisticated query optimization. Um, and that becomes, if you're doing any kind of advanced querying, that becomes painfully obvious um, as you can give Acero a really inefficient execution plan and it will really inefficiently execute it. Um, <laughs> um, so that's a, uh, you know, in some ways you can see that as a limitation, but uh, as Ian is about to talk about with, with Substrate, we're hoping to sort of um, avoid, as I said, trying to build the one size fits all solution and build some of these more narrowly focused components so that people that are interested in various different one size fits all solutions can piece together the, the components they need. Um, a few examples, as I said, this has started from people, you know, uh, this started very organically. Um, we had the Apache Arrow, Pi Arrow, um, our ours interface to Arrow and, and people asked for more and more functionality. And so we sort of grew more and more functionality. And then this kind of, it came out of almost a refactor of all of this functionality that we added it in. So um, Pi Arrow has this concept of data sets today. Um, it's a collection of files. You can repartition data sets. You can do some basic filtering and projection, um, pushing those down into parquet files. Uh, similarly, um, R has this integration with dplyr, which is a um, cool R tool for uh, basically building queries and defers execution for the end. Um, both of these things are now today powered by Acero. They had kind of started off as their own. Um, I think R and Acero kind of grew, the, the dplyr and Acero integrations grew up at the same time, but data sets had very much started off as its own thing and then it evolved to take advantage of some of this Acero infrastructure that was getting built up. 
And uh, now it uses this arrow as it tends to be more efficient about how it scans and processes data and parses it out to different threads. All right, um, yeah, final slide is just kind of, a, this is all part of the Apache Arrow project. I work with Voltron data, but pretty much all of my actual code and development work is through Apache Arrow, which is open and uh, would like everyone to join that is interested. Um, various different ways that you can join and get started, uh, improving some of our cookbooks, adding new recipes and examples or diving in and actually adding new features. Um, you know, we've been going through these last few months through Voltron Data and really trying to beef up our documentation here and making it easier to get involved and get started. Um, so I would encourage taking a look at some of these things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, happy to take any questions. questions? Yeah. Uh, great talk. Uh, so I didn't follow DPL uh, DPL applier package from R. Like I, you know, I, when I used R, it just started. So did I get it right that basically Deployer uh, does the <clears throat> lazy execution plan and gives it to Acer and Acer executes it. So like you don't do lazy execution, you just take whatever Deployer decides to do in the end and do it, right? Yes, and, and I may have, um, I should be clear that Deployer existed independently of Arrow for quite some time. And then when I say grew up with Acer, I meant the R Deployer, the kind of R Arrow Deployer integration group with this arrow, but but yes, um, it builds up the plan. That's all Deployer's responsibility. Um, Deployer has some hooks, basically, of saying, "Hey, the user is asking to uh, mutate," which is essentially a projection. Um, so go do whatever that mutation thing is. And, and Deployer exists um, originally it sort of allows you to lazily build up SQL queries that would eventually get submitted to databases. So we just hook in there, instead of building up an SQL query, we build up an Acero query. So another question. So uh, I met like last week uh, Pandas folks and asked what their plans are. So, and you know, they mentioned that actually reinventing the lazy query engine is a problem, right? Like it happens all over, it happens everywhere. So Spark has Catalyst, right? Uh, Ray will have to come up with their own eventually, right? So why not? Like, I mean, you don't want to be a database. Why not standardize on a lazy execution uh, engine? We, because it's already, right, happening. Like, the deployer people should not maintain their own or Catalyst. Like, I mean, it sounds like they're all reinventing the same thing which databases did since the 70s. Why not decide like, I mean, that would be a good home for lazy query engine as, you know, if anything, like, so like, why are you like, want to not, not want to have this? Sure. Well, um, I don't want to steal Ian's thunder entirely either. Uh, there are two parts to this. There's the, um, the kind of the API half of it. Uh, which has to be uh, tailored for each language. But admittedly, you probably don't need lots of different ones for Python. Um, then there's the, what do these things produce? Um, is it an SQL string or is it something more detailed? Because uh, it turns out it's helpful if it's something more detailed. And so I am involved, um, and Ian's going to talk a lot more about Substrate, which is a execution plan um, that a lot of these different APIs can all produce a common execution plan. And then we can standardize on that. And if your engines all understand the same execution plan, then it's just a matter of having different APIs. Um, I, I wouldn't be against that being standardized, but the API, I think different people tend to have, you know, pandas people probably want an API that looks a lot like pandas. We have a data frame and you're working with it. Um, IBIS is another cool project that's, has much more similar to a dplyr thing. And mm -hmm. then there's still a lot of people out there that just want to write SQL queries. Um, I don't think those people ever go away. A quick question. Um, so I just want to also plug uh, our Smartnix project. Um, and we were going to talk about that tomorrow, um, uh, where we work with some geonational apps to um, embed data processing, Apache error data processing into Smartnix. 
um, in HPC computers, right, where you have lots of applications running, they exchange data, and uh, you want to basically uh, transform the data in some interesting way, and it's often very much table-based data. Um, so uh, we have been looking at Acero, and one of the big stumbling blocks that we faced is that we needed to come up with a distributed uh, processing plan. So you have multiple smart links working together, right? And so we were very interested in your source node and your sync node. <laughs> and but there is sort of like still a little bit of heavy lifting, I think, necessary to 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 figure out how to connect these. And so I, you know, I wonder whether you are have plans to give at least sort of a high, a very lightweight um, distributed framework to connect different Acero uh, pipelines. Uh, or whether that's something that we should look at elsewhere. Uh, yeah, I think the input for Acero and the output for Acero right now, like you said, source node, the input is basically an iterator of batch futures. And, and the output is um, an iterator of batches. Uh, those are fairly generic, but we don't have a lot of the convenience APIs linking them to the different ways that you might have uh, these sources and syncs. So I know there is a PR underway right now to say, OK, let's turn. Maybe they're starting with uh, an iterator of vectors of arrays, or maybe they're starting with iterators of, maybe they actually have an iterator of record batches and not an iterator of record batch futures. Um, <laughs> And so being able to hook these things in more easily. Um, but that's the, the kind of single interface that I see as the glue between a lot of these things is um, within the Arrow C++ project, it would be an iterator of record batches or a record batch reader is sometimes um, called that as well. If you're talking about maybe interfacing beyond the Arrow C++ project, there is the C stream I'm going to get this wrong. C data streaming interface. Um, I saw that. Yep. Yep. Which uh, we should definitely, if we don't today, ha have very easy capability of saying, hey, I've got something that speaks the C data streaming interface. Can we use that as a source? Or, yeah. hey, can we take the sync of this and expose it over the C data streaming interface? Both of those should be possible. Um, but maybe those are gaps that we're missing at the moment. Thank you. All right. Um, one more. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have your hand up. Maybe that's accidental. Okay. Let's uh, let's move to the next speaker. Um, so let me just go back to my my cheat sheet here. Um, so the next talk is about error and substrate, the missing clue in the deconstructed database. Um, uh, Ian Cook is the product management director at Waltron Data after working on curriculum development first at Tibico Software and then Cloudera. He is the co-founder and director of the Research Triangle Analytics and the founder of, and director of the Raleigh Durham Chapel Hill R Users Group. Cook earned a Bachelor of Science degree in Applied Mathematics from Stony Brook and a university and a Master of Science in Statistics from Lehigh University. Thank you, Ian. And I'm sorry, you know, I just put together that bio that's not an authorized bio. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I hope that's all right. Um, but um, it, it was all factually correct. So that's okay. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carlos, for the invite. And I'm coming to you from uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, just down the road from another fine public university here. So um, yeah, so I'll speak to you today about these two open source projects, Arrow and Substrate, that together I think are poised to close the gap uh, that Carlos was talking about, this gap between you know compute and storage, and another gap uh, between users and compute, which we've observed is also another major gap and source of inefficiency in this whole this whole data ecosystem. Um, and so the, the talk title here refers to the deconstructed database. Well, what is that? Um, I'll explain it briefly in my slides here, but I'll also point you to this great article uh, from 2018 by Amandeep Karana and Julian Ledem 
Um, and I linked, I dropped the link into the Q and A doc, uh, so you can take a look at that there. Um, but here's a here's a summary of that sort of a history uh, that describes what that is. So right, traditionally, um, back in the day, let me try to annotate these slides so you can see what I'm trying to point out here. Uh, traditionally, back in the day, right, we had um, integrated uh, compute and storage. We had uh, RDBMSs like Postgres and MySQL and so forth, and commercial ones like SQL Server and Oracle. You load the data in, you, and these systems manage and store the data as well as doing all the compute. Uh, that's that's what vertically integrated means, right? So um, the language for accessing these, the sort of DSL for accessing these with SQL and its different dialects. Uh, and to connect different applications, um, you know, we had like ODBC, JDBC, some custom connectors. Uh, so this is what we had, you know, back in the early days. Um, but, uh, you know, in the first decade of the 2000s, we had this big data era, uh, you know, come upon us from the rise of like web scale data. Um, and these traditional RDBMS systems couldn't handle the volumes of data. So there were, you know, initially there were some commercial vendors uh, that came onto the scene, um, you know, Teradata, Netiza, Vertica, and others. Uh, later, there were some cloud vendors that got on and get got into this um, that had scale out data warehouse solutions uh, that helped stretch that same sort of uh, architecture to to larger scales. Um, meanwhile, uh, there were other communities of people who were sort of working outside of databases that it's important to call out here. Um, some people don't prefer to do their data analysis in SQL, as uh, Weston alluded to. Um, you know, Python users prefer something like pandas. Uh, and now we have IBIS and others as well uh, for Python. For R users, there's dplyr and data table, and you can just use base R if you like. Um, Java people, ways of doing things, you know, using like some libraries and code in Java. Um, so it's not it's not all about SQL. Uh, so meanwhile, back on this uh, in the on the query engine and storage layer. Um, you know, so we had these scale out data warehouse solutions, but as Weston alluded to, um, you know, you can never come up with like a single closed monolithic solution that's going to solve every problem. Uh, so, uh, you know, because of sort of the inflexibility of these solutions, we turned to the Hadoop ecosystem uh, and the Spark ecosystem and all this, um, which promised more openness, more flexibility uh, and better scale out economics. And it achieved this in large part by creating this gap that Carlos, you know, called out uh, by separating compute and storage. Um, so we saw the emergence of all these query engines, like originally, you know, Hive and then Impala, and Drill, Presto, Spark, Trino, many others, and then also storage systems separately, HDFS, uh, Alexio. Whoops, just accidentally skipped ahead. Alexio and others, um, and. Uh, uh, and then, you know, the cloud vendors got in on this also. And so we saw um, engines like Athena, BigQuery, storage systems in the cloud like S3 and uh, GCS. So um, one nice thing about this, you know, Hadoop style architecture is that you could just like put loads of CSV files or Parquet files into your storage system, uh, just point one of these engines at it and it would query them. Uh, and that was great, you know, especially for data scientists who are used to working in these sort of patterns up here, because uh, that's the way that's the way like Python, you know, with pandas or R with dplyr, that's the way it works, right? Um, you just have some files and you point your 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 engine at it uh, locally and, and, you know, and it works. This sort of took that same uh, end user pattern and made it work at scale. Um, and recently, Recently, even more of these engines have cropped up, and Weston talked about a few that are sort of built from the ground up in an arrow native way. So there's lots of engines to choose from. But uh, the trouble is, uh, right, all these query engines and all these storage systems don't always interoperate nicely. You can't just like pick an engine, pick a storage system, and expect that they'll work together. Um, there's some affinities and there's some you know hard incompatibilities as well. Uh, and this is you know one of the problems that Alexio is solving, which is very much needed. Um, there's also a lack of standardization for exactly how, uh, you know, the storage systems integrate with the query engines. Uh, there's not like a single data access API um, here. There's different interfaces uh, that, you know, different file systems implement. Um, 
and uh, this means that like every pairwise integration between a, an engine and a storage system is like a big ordeal to develop. Um, and then, you know, to further confuse matters, whoops, uh, to further confuse matters, some of these storage systems are, are not just storage systems. They actually are capable of doing some manner of compute in their own right, like pushed down, you know, compute, predicate push down and so forth. Um, but we don't have any agreed upon standard for how uh, you should specify to a storage system, hey, please, please execute this pushed down compute operation. Um, so, you know, systems like Kudu, S3 Select on AWS, uh, of course, uh, Ceph with Skyhook, uh, MinIO, also, you know, these can all do push down, um, but again, no standard interface to that. So I know this is a topic that's near and dear to Carlos, especially with things like SmartNICs coming on the scene and sort of making this, this uh, uh, the need for standards here even worse. So I'll return to this later. Um, and then at the client connectivity API layer here as well, uh, again, the interface between users and engines, we also have a lack of standardization that makes interoperability hard. Um, so this, this picture, you know, looks like uh, abundance, but it's really a bunch of, you know, maze full of dead ends. Um, so how can we solve this problem? Uh, well, this is where Arrow and Substrate come in. Um, so how do Arrow and Substrate solve this? Well, at its core, as, as Weston said, Arrow is a standard for representing tabular columnar data. Um, Substrate is a standard for representing compute operations, relational uh, operations on data. Um, so our vision is that these two projects will both get to like a high level of adoption um, so that, you know, uh, we can we can start to use them as this interconnection glue. Um, and by speaking these two languages, like any system can essentially make itself like modular and composable with all these other systems. Um, so I'll show a concrete example to kind of illustrate you know, uh, the before and after here. So this is the way a lot of um, end user clients, compute engines and storage systems interface with each other today, uh, sort of the old way of doing things, right? So on the client side, you write a SQL query um, in whatever dialect of, you know, SQL you need that the engine's expecting. Uh, your client sends that SQL query to, to the engine, the engine receives it, changes it into a query plan in whatever you know plan format your engine expects. Uh, and then it constructs a storage request. Uh, in this case, it's a get request from S3, um, sends that you know request to fetch the data from S3. S3 finds a bunch of files, sends the files back to the engine. Um, the engine then has to deserialize those files from whatever format they're in and uh, into its own you know, internal memory representation that it uses natively. Um, and then it executes the query plan on the, you know, deserialized data here, uh, generates a result set in its own custom format again, sends it back over the wire to the client, which probably ha has another, you know, serialization, deserialization step in it, uh, and then the client can consume it. Um, so that all works, <laughs> but you can see there's a lot of costly serialization, deserialization happening and sort of unnecessary volumes of data flowing over the network, which if it's slow, uh, you might have a problem. And also, uh, if you change what query engine you're using, your SQL query might need to be rewritten if it's a, in a you know, different dialect of SQL. So there's got to be a better way. Um, and we think there is. Uh, so with Arrow and Substrate, this flow looks quite different. So you start off the same way. You write an SQL query. Um, but then your client application would convert that query into a substrate plan. Um, and substrate is a binary format uh, for representing plans. It's based on uh, protocol buffers, uh, but you can sort of, you know, render it crudely in text like this. It just breaks down the query into a bunch of relations or query steps or operators, you might call them, um, and represents them all in a sort of JSON type structure in this binary format with lots of other detail, including like the, uh, uh, the schema of the source tables um, embedded in it. Uh, so that substrate plan gets sent to the engine. The engine reads it and uh, converts it to its own query plan, which in many cases is trivial because it doesn't involve any parsing. It's just, you know, converting a, uh, like a, a, plan, a plan structure to another plan structure. Um, 
And then what the engine would do is identify in this uh, plan if there's a piece of it that can actually be pushed down to a substrate consuming storage engine uh, or a sort of push down capable storage system. Um, so it would extract that uh, plan fragment that could be pushed down and send it to the storage system uh, as a substrate plan. The storage system would then um, you know, identify what files it needed to read or scan, uh, scan those and using that, uh, scan those and then apply the operations in the substrate plan, generate an arrow columnar data set, stream that arrow columnar data back to the engine. The engine would then execute the remainder plan. So the, the piece of the original plan that, that was not uh, pushed down to the storage system, that remainder plan gets executed on the intermediate data generating a final result set still in arrow format. That arrow, arrow formatted final result set gets sent to the client, um, which you know can work with it natively in arrow format. So there's, there's a serialization happening exactly once here, which is here when the, the files are being scanned and that's it. So we've dramatically kind of reduced the number of serialization deserialization steps. Um, and we're working with a protocol that arrow that can send data much more efficiently over the network. Uh, and we're working, you know, we're avoiding the need to have uh, multiple uh, places where, you know, queries are being parsed from strings. Um, so the other exciting thing about this is that if you don't like to use SQL, but you like to use, say, IBIS or another API that's capable of producing substrate, it's something we have in the works right now, uh, you just sub out your SQL query for an IBIS, for some IBIS code, everything else works exactly the same. Uh, likewise, for dplyr, for our users, you replace that with the dplyr code and everything else works exactly the same. Um, so this creates like true modularity at the top of the stack here, uh, at the language or domain specific language layer. All right, so I'm going to talk briefly about how some of this, this big vision is coming together, uh, what specific work we're doing. So Arrow is a standard, and I think many of you know all about Arrow. It's been around for uh, more than six years at this point. Substrate's also a standard, but it's much younger. Um, so there's some details of this substrate standard or spec that are already very well established, um, but uh, like it has, it has you know two parts. Uh, really, one is the operators or sort of uh, nodes that are all represented in uh, proto, proto files, proto buff files. Um, and it's capable of representing both sort of logical and physical query plans using these, uh, these uh, operators. There's also a whole spec in substrate for functions as well that you can compose into expressions. Uh, you know, your, your aggregates and your scalar functions, um, which are of course an important part of any sort of, uh, any workflow like this. Um, but there's work, you know, still ongoing, especially on the function side, to make sure that we create like a well-known canonical set of functions in core substrate to represent most of what we need to be able to do. Um, the spec itself is also extensible uh, so that, you know, individual producers or consumers of substrate plans can extend the spec if they agree upon, you know, the extension. And there's, if you want more information about sort of some of this work, there's a great talk. I'll try to dig up the link and put it in here afterwards um, in that Q&A doc uh, by the creator of Substrate, Jacques Nadeau, um, about, he gave a talk recently at the VLDB conference uh, where he talked about this, you know, how Substrate is extensible as well as other things. So I'll share that. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, there is work ongoing to create a substrate compiler for IBIS, which is this uh, Python uh, API, not dissimilar to Pandas, um, but you know, with some influence taken from dplyr. Uh, so there's, there's work to create a substrate producer there so that we can write IBIS code and, and then execute it on any substrate consuming engine. Uh, there's also work on going to do the same for dplyr for R. And there are two separate uh, uh, streams of work happening to be able to take SQL queries and convert them to substrate plans. Some of this work is going on in the core substrate project um, using Apache Calcite. There's a project called Ithsmiths, which um, uh, Jacques Nadeau and some others are working on. And then 
DuckDB separately, uh, the folks at DuckDB Labs have created a way to have DuckDB consume an SQL query, parse it, and then return the plan as substrate format instead of actually executing the plan on the DuckDB engine. So that's really exciting. Um, and this is, I think, uh, this is an area, I think there was a question earlier about sort of like optimizations and where we can perform them. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things where I think I'm hoping is that uh, we can use sort of pluggable tools to be able to apply transfer or optimizations to, um, to substrate plans. Uh, especially sort of logical optimizations to substrate plans um, in a modular way so that instead of sort of having the optimizer be tightly coupled to the engine, um, some parts of the optimizer can be like loosely coupled modular components uh, with logic and like, you know, projects like DuckDB. Uh, there's also, there's always a place for sort of lot, uh, some physical optimization, which is probably going to have to be tightly coupled to the engine. But um, a lot of what we consider optimization is really general enough to be uh, done on a, on, a, on a logical plan. Uh, I Yeah, so Weston talked about arrow native query engines. Um, the great news is a lot of those arrow native query engines are also becoming substrate compatible or substrate, you know, uh, substrate native query engines. Um, there's work in Acero, in DataFusion, uh, and in DuckDB also. And I should have mentioned um, Velox also. So all four engines that um, that Weston mentioned have projects to create substrate consumers so that they can receive plans as substrate and then execute them. Uh, yeah, this this you know topic of how we get substrate to storage systems and things like smart NICs, lower level you know storage uh, hardware uh, or storage systems. This is an area of great interest that we uh, unfortunately have not had much much uh, work in yet. And I'm you know eager to to continue the conversation with Carlos and and um, anyone else who's interested about how we can how we can do this because I think this is a huge opportunity for substrate. And then there's a bunch of other substrate tooling, which in the interest of time, I'll kind of skip over. Um, but a validator, you know, consumer integration testing and more. Um, and there's also integration between substrate and other parts of the Arrow uh, community, uh, including like uh, the database connectivity flight and ADBC standards, um, which uh, again, I won't, won't get into details in the interest of time. Um, Substrate has uh, an active community with like meetings and um, mailing lists and so forth. So if you're interested in getting involved, uh, check out uh, the links here, substrate.io slash community is the main place. And then uh, Voltron Data, you know, where Weston and I work also shares a lot of news about what's going on in this space. So uh, check that out. And that's all I have. Thank you. And uh, if we have time for questions, I'd be happy to take a few. Questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you, and great talk. A question. So uh, the Substrate language, is it lazy by default? So but do you assume that everything is lazy and so the optimizers can run? So what's the notion of strictness versus laziness as expressed in the language? Yeah, so the way that we expect an API would produce a Substrate plan would be to, uh, you would compose, as, as an end user, you'd compose together all the steps of your, your query uh, and then the API would then take all those, uh, you know, defer in a, a deferred or lazy evaluation context and create a substrate plan from all of them. So it's, it would, it wouldn't, yeah, it's, it's inherently sort of a deferred um, design where you need the totality of all the steps and then you, you compose them together and create a plan from all those. But you assume that essentially all operations allow laziness, right? So basically you're free to reorder them in any, in any way. Right? Yeah, I'm not sure I completely understand, but um, yes, I mean, I yeah, there's, I think, you know, uh, the intent is to allow users to sort of compose, compose query plans or query steps together in any order they want and have the format sort of represent that. But maybe I can clarify a bit, right? So this, the, the question comes from programming languages, right? So Haskell is all lazy by default. So basically I don't expect it to get anything done until you demand the result and output it, right? So I'm, unless I always is involved, in closure, closure is a common mistake for newbies. Everything is strict, but map is lazy. If you have a sequence, all the computations will be done immediately, and results evaluated, even if they're not printed. But if you access a map or a sequence, 
right? It will be lazy, so you have to force. So basically, I, I would, I think that the question makes sense in terms of if the consuming API exists in a programming language, it will have to obey the semantics of that language. So I just wonder what will happen at the very end. So like, are you going to be smart spitting out substrate results to Haskell? Or closure can be smart, but like to something just strict, you will have to do it first and like hope it will fit buffer, right? Like something like this. I'm just like, I think the, the, the result, the handling, handing off to substrate from a programming language and receiving it uh, will have to obey the laziness semantics in the, in the host language. Yeah, I think I understand. Yeah, so I, I think that a substrate plan generally will be consumed by an engine and converted into some other sort of abstract syntax tree, DAG type of structure, uh, mm -hmm. and then only executed on data after that conversion has happened. So the way that languages do that or systems do that conversion, I mean, it's sort of an implementation detail, I guess, but I would assume that most of them do it in a sort of lazy way. Uh, yeah. But, you know, we're not on the data path with uh, substrate plans, so the sort of size of a of a substrate plan would generally be like orders of magnitude smaller than the data size um, that it's operating on so um, sort of regardless of some of those details i would expect that like uh you're not going to you know this isn't going to emerge as the bottleneck um, mm -hmm. in anyone's like data workflow so it's you know substrate to me is basically you know, and I think that uh, Jacques Nadeau, and I can highly recommend the VLDB talk, it's actually part of a workshop called Composable Data Management Systems, uh, which I highly recommend just looking at it. It's the first one of its kind, and, and I think uh, super future, I think, that workshop. Um, so, uh, and so in his talk, he sort of also clarifies this, this, this notion of, you know, this idea of intermediate representation and, and how, for instance, in a in the C, C world, in the C++ world, right, there's like L, the LLVM intermediate representation. And so for me, this is actually very interesting to see substrate that way, um, because what you find in the compiler tool chain is that this intermediate representation is used for all kinds of optimizations and communication between these different tools. And, um, and so uh, what I find particularly interesting is this notion of uh, physical optimization, uh, you know, or based on, 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 on the actual data content, right? So can you imagine, for instance, uh, that the communication kind of goes also the other way, right? So when uh, in your overview picture, you had like substrate, part of the substrate plans, you know, being basically sent down to the storage layer, the storage layer has actually information about, you know, statistics or something. And then when you return, um, the data, you have some kind of uh, statistics, or maybe even before that, you can actually get statistics about the data um, that is actually in a storage system. I'm, I'm just very hand wavy here, right? But can you imagine that, that actually consumers can also be producers um, uh, of information in that immediate representation? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in that architecture here, you know, uh, the the engines in the middle are serving as as consumers and producers. The engine is extracting the sort of push downable, you know, part of the query, uh, and then creating a substrate like a sub plan, um, which you know is not just simply sort of grabbed out of there, but per perhaps like actually constructed. Uh, by like looking at that query and seeing what can be pushed down. So um, yeah, and, and then optimizations have, could happen in the engine or separate from it. Uh, and so there's this whole, yeah, there's this whole concept of sort of middleware that um, consumes and produces substrate plans in order to uh, extract predicates and optimize and, and things like that. And yeah, I think, you know, um, we're gonna need a lot of tooling like that. Producers at the top, consumers at, at the bottom, and then a, a lot of, uh, a lot of tools in the middle that do that do both. Yeah, and so that's just to close up. We have to. We're kind of running out of time because, and we, we're preventing people to go to lunch. So <laughs> it's always a dangerous situation to be in. But I, I think that um, just so that the last yeah. question that it kind of binds everything together is, um, you know, substrate is a fantastic way to describe what's in the in a cache, um, right? And so I wonder whether Luxio has any plans to to you know, to describe essentially what's in the cache so that, that other engines can sort of look at, um, um, you know, at, at, at sort of a standard way of, of, 
of, of determining whether data is in the cache or not. I'm not a representation uh, company, but uh, to be honest, I use uh, arrows several times, like uh, several times, like years ago. And actually, I found that uh, I found like arrow because actually it's uh, like a uh, data set between the computing framework. And actually, it's like uh, have a natural way to fit into a large because we do the caching. And uh, I mean, you always have some legacy data in a different format, no matter in CSV mm -hmm. or like uh, 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 a packet or whatever like this. So they are designed for different reasons. And arrow is designed for the fast feeding, especially for the computing. Actually, we find that it will be very natural for you to like do the translation, transformation, especially in the cache. Mm -hmm. Actually, storage can provide this kind of work. Previous we launched a project called the transformation for the CSV to the packet. Actually, we get very good speed. But I, I, I do see like we have potential to cover the arrow. Oh, yeah. Yeah, hi, Ian. So, um, it's, it, Substrate is actually very interesting. So, I'm wondering how far have you gone you know, through the tooling? For an example, do we have like a parser so that we could look at a substrate plan and, you know, pass it so that I, I myself and my group, we are building up the distributed memory solutions on top of arrow uh, tables. So uh, we would like to see if we could trans translate a substrate plan into uh, our silent groups plan, things like, things like that. So yeah, there's, there's some uh, work that's done in the substrate GitHub org to create like substrate bindings, which are, yeah, in, intended to do that. Um, that work of you know taking a plan and then just sort of representing it as a structure in that languages like you know some sort of JSON type or list structure or something in that languages uh, you know own semantics. Um, but then a lot of the work that's being done is sort of not uh, intended to be reusable so much. It's just we're really creating substrate consumers that just go and and create a custom plan object and then execute it. Uh, for that system. So I think that's, you know, take a look at what's there, but I don't think there's much being done in like Python or C++, for example, to create like a more generic substrate consumer. Uh, that would that would be interesting work to see happen. Yeah, that would be, if it, if it did, I mean, Carlos and I, we also worked together. We just had some initial discussions and that is something that came about saying, okay, if I give you a substrate plan, would you be able to do it, run it? I would say yes, but we need to translate it. So if there were a bit of more tooling, that would be nice. Uh, otherwise, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very exciting. Buffers, yeah, protocol buffers sort of is, the whole point of it is to make some of that as easy as possible. I mean, uh, you know, that's why we based the standard on, on protobuf, um, but there's still some sort of non-trivial code in some cases that needs to happen. Um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be cool to see that. Yeah. Yeah, just to give background for everyone, so Niranda Pereira is the, the lead on the Silent project, uh, silent, silentdata.org, um, really interesting distributed um, processing of data using a bug synchronous method and using OpenMPI as a, as a, a you know, coordinated or processing platform. So very interesting for us also in the context of the SmartMix project. Um, so it's... Uh, yeah, so that would be really fantastic if we can somehow get substrate onto that project as well. Um, Wes, is Wes, Wes is holding up. No, Wes is still some. Wes, yeah, are you here? Trying to talk. Are you? Um, maybe Wes had just his hand up, but didn't want to say anything. So. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Okay. Is it, is it too noisy right now? So I, you just mentioned that the, there is a, uh, the producer can extract a part of the plan from the substrate. Is that, is that function, is that feature currently implemented or it is the ongoing work right now? That's ongoing work. Yeah, that's, not, that's something oh, that like Weston and team, uh, I think eventually hope to do in Acero and some of these other Aero native engines as well that consume substrate uh, are interested in doing that. But yeah, I'm not aware of any like existing implementation that does that. 
I see. Because that that's an important component for, because I'm working on the smart project, and that's that's really important component for distributed the the planning onto multiple smart and doing the execution um, on different places. Yeah, we were sort of jokingly referring to that as substrate surgery. And, you know, it's, I mean, it's something that can be done in, in a, it doesn't have to be done in the context of a specific engine, right? Uh, I mean, if, if you understand what the capabilities of a specific storage engine are, or SmartNIC, for, for instance, uh, you should be able to sort of in a, you know, in any arbitrary library, like take a substrate plan um, and extract like the sub plan that is push downable. Um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear more about your work. And I know that Carlos and I are gonna follow up about, about some of this too. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for your answer. I'm gonna have a presentation tomorrow and about a Somatic project and help you there. Absolutely, yeah, I'm gonna attend, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we don't want to prevent people from going to lunch. So <laughs> thank you, Ian, thank you, Wes. Thanks. Thank you both from Aluxio um, uh, to, to come here and, and, and present, and it was a great session. Thank you so much. Thank you.